this, people saw the performance of cannabis in, in the context of the AIDS epidemic. It changed the way people responded to cannabis, the way people saw cannabis, the way people treated people who used marijuana. Everything changed, but this was a slow change. Each patient, each person was really good at speaking about what their condition was, whether it was chemotherapy, whether it was glaucoma, whether it was full-blown AIDS, whatever it was, people were very, very good at, at discussing their medical condition, their use of pot, and why they did it. And those stories went out and just were echoed. People were all over the world talking about marijuana and medicine. And this was a big change. This was something that could help people feel better, be healthier, um, and it was something that uh, gave people support when there was not a lot of other support. And the movement arose in San Francisco that ultimately led, led to legalization of medical cannabis in the 90s. Passion programs are part of the DNA of cannabis. And the theory is very simple, that for people who need uh, cannabis as medicine, uh, but don't have money, um, we should be able to give them free medical cannabis. They couldn't all afford it, which is why we started Sweet Leaf and brought attention to the fact that there needs to be a nonprofit sector in this industry. We understood that low-income terminally ill patients a lot of times have mobility issues, and so we decided to deliver it to their homes. Everyone should have a right to be able to access medicine. Uh, and when we say that only people who can afford it can access medical cannabis or cannabis, um, that means that you're either denying access to people, um, which makes people less healthy and is very inequitable. Now, if you're a patient, you're presumed to be recreating. And so your options are much more limited. You don't, we're not, you're not getting the same respect as you were getting before. A big thing with the law that they did not address when they drafted it is the difference between commercial and non-commercial cannabis. So what we ran into is that for us to give away compassionate cannabis, we were now required to pay taxes on it. But, you know, a 21-year-old person could just go and get cannabis now, non-medically, and that was legal, but then it's not legal to give free cannabis to a low-income terminally ill patient. And so legalization technically made compassion illegal. And compassion was the way that we got here in the first place. There was a dramatic effect in the compassion community. You know, we've lost people because they didn't have access when they had access for over 20 years. It's people who for the past 30 years have been part of a system that they were told, we're gonna take you out of that system, bring you to the legal market, and then have been blocked because they don't have the ability to get to the legal market. These are the same people who are providing medicines to people five years ago, seven years ago, nine years ago, 20 years ago. I have been an advocate for medical cannabis for about 24 years now, and I got involved because I saw the need that there were people who were dying who did not have access to medical cannabis. I was infected with AIDS virus 35 years ago. If it wasn't for good old marijuana or medicinal cannabis, I wouldn't have been able to survive psychologically. When I got sick and I thought I was going to die, I, I gave away all my money to the AIDS organizations and turned my company over to my employees. And uh, when you're really sick, you know, you don't have the ability to work. That's when I found out about Sweet Leaf. They were providing free cannabis for people of low income that couldn't afford it. And they would come up, you know, deliver it to the house. And I'm totally blind and half deaf. And so it's very difficult for me to get around. So it has such beneficial overall attributes that uh, it works really well. Ed, it's been a pleasure, as always. But now it forced 
low-income sick people to buy off the black market. It's the only place they could afford to buy it. And now that they put in a very restrictive regulated form of, of, of a cannabis law, we've now seen what nobody wanted. People go to the black market for their medicine quite often because it's enticing, especially when you're on a fixed income and you don't have the money to buy the, the product at the licensed retailers. Most of my medicine comes from the duty free, the traditional market. I can't afford to go to the, the legal market place for as much as I have to medicate and how much I do medicate with. I joined the Marine Corps in September 2003. I did four years, so I got out September 2007. You get out, you go home. Everybody's around for the first couple weeks because you're home. After that, everybody goes back to their lives. Everybody goes back to their jobs, their families, and normal life. And veterans getting out early need help. We need more support. The quality of medicine I need, and I believe that most people should be ingesting, to go to the stores, it's at that over $50 a gram for concentrates, up to $100, $120 a gram. And I go a gram or more a day. So I can't spend that to get the quality I need in the retail stores. What do you think is gonna happen when you take a 100% disabled vet making 3,000 a month and say he has to pay $1,400 a month to medicate through a dispensary? Veterans are left to figure it out, find their way. They're committing suicide. They're, they're going to drugs. They're, they're using alcohol. I got friends, combat veteran friends that are drinking themselves away right now. With the limited licenses, you create the supply chain and then there's bottleneck at the retail. Over 70% of the state doesn't have access to cannabis, to retail stores. They have to go to big cities. When you get in the rural California, the big counties, Kern County, they're not allowing it. It is taboo, they don't want it. I wasn't getting the pharmaceutical quality that I felt like I needed for my MS. Forget the availability of, of street level weed. I mean, that was everywhere, but it was just not being able to get what I needed, the pharmaceutical side. Multiple sclerosis, it's a spectrum disease. Mine just got to, a, a, to an extent where I suffered paralyzation. The only way I can explain it to somebody that doesn't have MS is like, if you've ever been at a gym and you've been working your muscles so hard that you get that lactic acid build up in your muscles. So imagine having that burning sensation in your muscles and then the numbness of not being able to feel, you know, not being able to feel your nerves and stuff that it, it turns into, it turns into that kind of a flare up. And that's, that's where the cannabis helps is the, it takes away the burning, takes away the, uh, the spasms, you know, it allows a relaxing movement to take over your body and then you can just sleep normally. It just lessens the pain. The less dispensaries you have, the more difficult it is to find cannabis. We're hearing stories of people in counties where they have bands and they have to do a five hour round trip to go and purchase cannabis. And if they have to do that every week, that is really a large burden. There was actually a lot of controversy within the community because I think a lot of um, people supporting access were concerned it would become more expensive, harder for people to, without means to access. Once Proposition 64 was implemented, you know, my lawyers told me that I was gonna have to change our business model or closed down and so I went online and I started finding other compassion groups and we started lobbying. SB 34 is the Dennis Prone Brownie Mary Act um, that was introduced by Senator Weiner out of San Francisco. We introduced legislation in 2018 to say that if you are a compassion program you're exempt from state tax, period. We got um, strong bipartisan support and Governor Brown sadly vetoed it. So I reintroduced it in 2019. We moved it through the process. Governor Gavin Newsom uh, signed the bill SB 34. 
And what it does is it exempts all compassionate cannabis from taxes, so long as the cannabis is designated as compassion at the cultivator level. SB 34 gives a pathway for manufacturers and distributors to give it through the legal pipeline to get it to a retail store to get it out to people for free of cost to that patient. I told him if he doesn't pass it, there are going to be people who are going to be hurt. And he signed it. And thank God he did. You know, if, they, if we didn't have compassionate care, you can see this blind guy down on Market Street in the Tenderloin trying to buy weed, and they'd rip me off. It's important for people to have access to medical cannabis because it's what they prefer over prescription drugs, and it's very important. It's just like if you needed an aspirin for a headache or some pain, you can go next door to 7-Eleven and buy it. I don't see why there needs to be any difference with cannabis. As much as it's been difficult, I am looking forward to a much brighter future where compassion is more implemented, where it's just an integral part of the industry. We have to take a more thoughtful approach where we look at some substances like cannabis can be so healthy and good for so many people. Uh, moving away from prohibition and towards a health approach uh, to cannabis and other substances uh, is incredibly important. We think we've solved the problem of businesses not being able to provide uh, free medical cannabis to those who simply cannot afford it. It took a while, but a solution has been fashioned. Now it has to be implemented, of course, and the devil's in the details. But that's certainly an example of the legislature responding to a problem and a request. I really can't tell you how many times I've made deliveries personally on my bike and when I come into the patient's house, uh, they're completely in tears. And they repeat that they would already have died if it wasn't for a sweet leaf. And, uh, and that's why we do what we do. That's why we feel that it's so important that's why we fight so hard. Just because you think cannabis is the cash cow. It's kind of like a reverse war on drugs or a war on drugs 2.0. It's like you're setting us up to fail. Many individuals and operators just don't start a chance before they even get out of the gate. And those issues are, are even compounded.